Uh, well, thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, it, it's a weekend, uh, and this is a, a, a tribute to what you're thinking about and how important you think it is. Um, I obviously think it's very important. Um, as Sarah said, I'm from the part of CDC that looks at healthcare. Um, healthcare and infection control related issues have not been a long standing part of public health. Um, the entire field didn't exist until around 1972, 73, when people started noticing, I think that pseudomonas is actually spreading in the hospital, right? I think there's something we're doing in the burn unit that's causing problems. And that led to the gradual evolution of a field of study of healthcare quality and infection prevention. Um, what I want to talk to you today uh, about is, that was bad grammar, um, is what is special about the healthcare sector when you think about it in terms of public health and sort of the bigger picture of, of prevention. The biggest thing I think that we need to be conscious of is that many aspects of what we think about in terms of public health projects uh, or even programs are very, very um, clear cut and sometimes even short term. Thinking about the vast amount of work that it takes to get rid of polio, right? It's a huge job globally, but if you think about it, you're, you're delivering vaccine to the field, maintaining a cold chain, keeping records, doing this one thing. If you get it done, you get to walk away, right? That's kind of a luxury in public health. Most of what we do requires ongoing, sustained investment and capacity. Um, anybody working with state health departments has seen the ups and downs of, of funding and resources that has a direct impact on what we all do. Anybody working in a health system right now understands just how close to the edge many facilities are in terms of resources. Um, this is a challenging situation in which to try and implement something that is not a one-shot deal. Right? Infection control, healthcare quality is investing in something that you're going to maintain forever. And this is what's killing me personally. Well, uh, that and butter, but um, <laughs> when, I, when I think about West Africa, for example, in the aftermath of, of Ebola, um, it's still there. It's an endemic disease. The fact that we're not seeing transmission right now is great, but it will probably come back. And despite the millions and millions of dollars and, and person hours that have been invested globally in that region, um, you know, how do you set up something that's going to be maintainable? Where is the disposable PPE going to come from once it's not donated? Um, what do we do about maintaining a water supply once you don't have a truck to go to the river? Um, you know, these are the very concrete things that um, I can point to when we're talking about something as stark as a remote Ebola outbreak. When you translate that to healthcare systems in, in, in this country, um, we have the good fortune on the one hand of having resources. We can generally rely on cl clean running water. Um, someone takes the waste away. This is all very good. Um, we can take a lot of that for granted. What we often don't appreciate is how much stuff there is to pay attention to. The amount of detail, the amount of complexity in a modern hospital in this country is crazy. Right? If you think about the number of interactions a single patient has with radiology techs, with nurses, with reception, with clinicians, with laboratories, it's, it's very complex, and you multiply that by tens of thousands of patients every single day, and the size of the problem becomes rapidly enormous. And so a lot of what we think about is, what do the systems look like to make this successful? What do we need to build so that we're not caught flat-footed? So, um, oh, I, I, I'm a Fed. I have no disclosures to make. Um, so what are we here talking about today? Um, emerging infectious diseases. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a few examples of those emerging infectious diseases. Um, some of them are, are very much um, of the Ebola variety, but not all of them. They all share the, the, the sorts of things that I have listed here. Um, new environments. You know, when, when you build a new residential community in the forests um, of, of Connecticut, you displace the deer, but they still hang around, and the ticks that they have on them end up causing Lyme disease. Right? That's an emerging infection that we created by going there. Every time we take down a prairie dog colony in Colorado to build a housing development, it's not just housing development. If you're in the housing industry, I apologize. Um, but, uh, when we do this, suddenly we have um, plague-bearing fleas that live on prairie dogs that cause little clusters of plague, 
right? The things we do environmentally have a direct impact on what we do. Um, vector exposures, you know, there, there's nothing more obvious right now than the Zika virus issue with the change in um, mosquitoes that are moving across the planet. Um, but also procedures. I don't know if you've been following some of the cosmetic procedures that are becoming prevalent. People like to have fat sucked out, um, and, and I, I appreciate that. But it's a problem when what really should be a sterile surgical process gets shifted to a place where those resources of sterilization, disinfection, environmental infection control may not be so good. What do I see? I see people coming back from questionable places having had liposuction that had tap water contamination of the trocar. What's in tap water? Well, a lot of organisms that don't harm us when we drink them, right? We've got you know, um, stomachs that are designed to disinfect things. We have salivary enzymes and so on. But when you slide that under the skin into the fat layer and cause a lot of trauma, those non-tuberculous mycobacteria, right, M. chimera, those things that live in tap water all the time are now seeded throughout that fat layer. And over the course of the next eight months, you get these horrible festering infections that are very difficult to treat. Um, I see this pattern happening again and again. I'm going to show you a couple of additional examples. Um, societal factors and populations. Um, I'll also show you a couple of examples of, um, of the healthcare system in general, but you know, think about what nursing homes look like today. You know, if you go back 30 years, nursing homes were residential places that might have somebody to help remind you about medication. Whereas today, people are actually delivering basic medical care in many <coughs> nursing home settings. Do they have the training, the infrastructure, the help that they need? Probably not. Are they well resourced? Not generally, right? So I, I see many patterns that lead to these outbreaks. Monkeypox, it's, it's been a couple uh, years now, um, but this is a great example. Prairie dogs, once again, implicated. Um, the giant pouched rats that live in West Africa, they carry monkeypox. It's, it's normal to have monkeypox in West Africa. It is not normal to drag a giant pouched rat back to the United States, uh, much less sell it as a pet. Um, people who, I, the, you, you, I'm sure you've seen this, it's kind of like gun shows. Um, they also have pet shows where people swap animals um, and, and, and it's completely unregulated and there's no attention to health and sanitation. Well, what happened was somebody stored a bunch of prairie dogs, which for the record are vermin. In case they're cute, but they are vermin. Um, we suck them out of the ground in the prairie when we build housing developments. Um, they put them in the same box, transported them to a fair, and a family said, oh, what a cute prairie dog, and adopted it. The, the um, daughter cuddled the prairie dog and ended up getting monkeypox on her face. Um, the veterinary technician who then saw to the prairie dog got monkeypox all over their hands. The, you know, the things that come out of this kind of experience are helpful. I mean, number one, don't cuddle vermin, right? Um, this is important. Just because it's cute doesn't mean it's good. But number two, this was an opportunity for us to do outreach with the American Veterinary Medical Association and say, look, you know, you guys are cowboys, I love you, um, and you do cool stuff, but this whole barehanded surgery slash, you know, I'm invincible, I touch dirty things all the time, that approach is not going to do you well when something new comes into the country or into your practice. And so it's been useful for that reason. Um, Ebola you're going to hear a lot more about. Um, this is something that we've dealt with globally for a very long time, since the 70s. Um, the difference between now and then is twofold, but it's all about the fact that this last outbreak took place in an urban concentration setting. Um, in previous outbreaks, and I've been on dozens of them, um, it's usually a tiny, tiny little village, you know, a three-day drive through no roads, um, in the jungle to get to that village. And so the ability of people who are infectious to get back to a population center, spread infection, or even worse, get on an airplane and spread infection, um, was essentially zero, right? Not true in West Africa where there were bigger cities, more crowding, and the access to international transportation. That's the main thing that we saw that was different that caused this huge outbreak. The other thing that we saw was that when you shift the type of care that you deliver, from basic supportive care, which is what was traditionally done in remote locations. Why? Because if you give IV fluids and you overhydrate somebody with leaky lungs, then they go into failure. You don't have dialysis available. You don't have ventilators available. And so you can actually kill people with IV hydration if you don't have those safety nets. 
in a better hospital setting, and certainly in the United States, we're able to do those things, and so we're able to give much better support, as you'll hear from Dr. Lyon. Well, that's good, but it also comes with a need to rethink how things are done. And so one of the reasons for the investment from the Health and Human Services Department and CDC in NITEC is to say we need a resource of experts who think about delivering care in this country using the technology that we take for granted in order to make sure that everything is still safe. MERS, lastly, another zoonotic disease, airborne, potentially, not highly airborne like tuberculosis, but it seems to be doing a little bit of you know, close zone spread. Um, we take this very seriously, and it's a big challenge on the horizon if it takes off. Right? It'll probably do what SARS did and sort of blend off into the distance, but we're getting another bump in the Middle East right now. Um, there's a lot of travel. We made it through the Hajj last year without a lot of importation, so that was good. But what happens when one of your facilities is faced with a plane load of people that lands, they're all febrile within the first week, um, you know, they've exposed all of their family members, and now you've got something on the order of 1,000 people you know, with potential symptomatic transmissible infection through the respiratory route. You know, none of us are set up to handle that in an isolation setting. And so that gets us back to then, you know, 15 years ago, when we all were talking about pandemic planning, right? Are we ready for a pandemic? I don't think we are. You know, I think we're better at it than we were when we started. We've got better relationships. We know more about who to talk to and how to work together. This is all good. But do we have vast resources of negative pressure isolation rooms and ventilators and emergency transport? You know, it's, it's not perfect yet. So there's still work to be done. This I show you just because I really like this picture. This is um, from the SARS outbreak, so it's old. But this is just a great illustration of how from that central Hotel M in Hong Kong, all of those yellow circles on the left are different hospitals in Hong Kong. And then all of these boxes on the right are different countries. And you just see how the diaspora of one individual getting sick in a hotel led to this global outbreak. Um, the efficiency with which we can spread things as a race is, is tremendous. This is not a successful slide. It looks great in the dark. <laughs> uh, but what you're looking at is mold on a culture plate. So if you look at my white whiskers and sort of think of that clumped on, 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 on a plate, this is the mold that was transmitted through um, injections of corticosteroids. The Northeastern uh, New England compounding pharmacy outbreak from two years ago. Um, this affected many different streets. Uh, we had something like 14,000 patients exposed to this stuff. What kills me here is that there's no good evidence that injections of steroids into your back for chronic back pain is a good thing, right? There's essentially no data supporting it, and yet people with back pain are so plagued by it, they're willing to try anything. Um, that's one problem, but then when you link that, sort of a perfect storm, with the problem of uh, compounding pharmacies and how they're regulated, if I'm a manufacturer of drugs, I have to do good manufacturing processes, right? I have to prove it. FDA regulates me. I have to test the product at the end of the process to make sure it's sterile. There's a lot that I have to do. It's expensive. If I'm a compounding pharmacy and not a manufacturer, I don't have to do any of that, right? And this is how this particular pharmacy, and I'm sure a few others, makes tremendous profit. They buy inexpensive base materials. They don't do any of the due diligence. They sell it at 30% off compared to the commercial product. And all of these different states saw this on the internet and said, oh, that's a bargain. We'll order from them. And the next thing you know, you have patients coming in with a horrible headache. Why do I show you this particular outbreak? This is because we, we relied on sentinel detection by one really smart state health department individual. It was Marion Kaner. She put the pieces together and said, wait, 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 um, fungal meningitis and back pain, steroid injection, you know, compounding, this just smacks of something. And so she put her foot down day one. Had it been someone else or, or, or people without that kind of thoughtful process, this could have smoldered and instead of 14,000, it could have been 50,000, right? There are still people in the United States suffering from ongoing chronic infection with mold in the brain. This is a bad thing. Um, what it means, though, is we need people who can connect those dots. It always boils down to people, right? And we need a fast way to notify and address the problem. So quickly getting information out to people who have back pain, quickly talking to the professional societies and the payers who deal with that pain treatment world, 
uh, working directly with FDA so that they can force a recall. There are all of these things that have to come together very quickly. It's chaotic. There are toes that get stepped on and nothing ever works as smoothly as you would hope. But this is what happened and it was about as good as it could get. Now that it's darker, I'm gonna go back to, no, nope, it's still bad. Oh well, I am an optimist as you can see. Um, switching to um, NTMs, um, there's a picture here. It's not coming up. I wonder if any of the pictures come up, okay. So <clears throat> another classic case of unintended consequences. Um, we're seeing people getting non-tuberculous mycobacteria infections, M. chelonii, M. chimera, um, after heart operations, um, open heart operations, valve, replace, uh, valve replacements, and that sort of thing. And it's been traced back to these heater cooler units. Um, the big picture of it is not showing, so I will show you some close-ups. Um, these are little roll aboard sort of um, stainless steel boxes that create cold or hot water uh, reservoirs for heat exchange. This is how we cool down the fluid around the heart so that the heart gets so cold that it's not damaged while it's outside of the body, right? Um, there's also a heating function that is used to circulate water through heating blankets. So it's a very important piece of equipment. And I wanna be very clear, we don't wanna get rid of useful equipment, but we do need to think about what that equipment does when you put it into, to, into practice. In this case, you're looking at a stainless steel box um, and a compressor, right, with a, with, a, with a cooling unit at the bottom and a fan that looks an awful lot like the fan in the front of a car engine. The louvers that you can see on the edge of the box um, there are, are where the fan forces the air out. So just right there, stop and think about this. Here's the patient in the operating room. Here's the heater cooler unit, the tray table, and the anesthesiologist, right? Open chest. And you've got a fan that big blowing air out the louvers in a very chaotic way. Just starting with the fan alone, this is not good. Um, also, just as a heads up, there's um, up above circuit boards that have their own cooling fans that are higher up. Well, what's higher up is the tray table with your sterile equipment, right? So again, fans are problematic. The reason I show you this um, is that you can see evidence of water having cooled um, here and down here on the flat surfaces inside of the machine. Where is the water coming from? Here's another piece of the machine that's foam insulation that sort of keeps the warm reservoir warm. You can see someone tried to scrape away some mildew. Okay, also not good. Um, why is this happening? How many of you have been in an operating room? Icy cold, right? 60 degrees or something like that, sometimes colder. Um, it, it, just for the record, that's so you don't sweat as much. It's not because it kills bacteria. I had somebody tell me, oh, we keep it cold to prevent infections. Like, mm, no, actually not. <laughs> nice try. I'll get back to that issue in a moment. Um, but think about this. You've got foamy, uncleanable, unreprocessable material, right? Uh, you've got a stainless steel box with a hot water reservoir creating steam in a steel box in a 60 degree room. What's the steam gonna do? It's gonna condense and drip down. What happens when you've got puddles of water, environmental micro, uh, microbes like NTMs, fungi, et cetera, grow happily? And then when you turn the fan on, that stuff is shaken up and aerosolized. So is there any surprise that this can actually lead to infection? After the fact, with what I know now, there's no surprise. Did I ever stop when I was working in hospitals in infectious diseases and say, we should check into heater cooler units in the operating room? No, this is a beautiful stainless steel European manufactured thing that looked really modern and had touch panels. It has to be perfect, right? It's kind of like prairie dogs. Just because it has touch panels doesn't mean it's safe. Um, prairie dogs do not have touch panels. Um, but what this is, is another indicator of a different direction, right? Here we're not looking at one smart individual who says, oop, I found a problem, we need to act. This is an array of people who need to be thinking about infection transmission in healthcare settings. Um, and it's not the people you normally think about. It's not just nurses and doctors. It's not the infection control professional necessarily. Think about the materials management guys, right? Because no one else is gonna take apart that steel cabinet, right? Infection control professionals almost never pack screwdrivers. So you want people who are doing materials management to have a sense of what's concerning, of what they should be focusing on. You want them to be thinking about the fact that if you can't reprocess and clean a foam insulation piece, scraping off the mold is not the solution, right? 
That also means empowering them to call the C-suite and say, look, we need to rethink this device. Um, here's what it's going to cost to replace all of them outright. Here are the options. Um, in Europe, they did two things. One, one group in Holland actually drilled holes in the operating room wall, put a little gasket on it, and ran tubes through it. So the machine is in the hallway outside of the operating room, and the heater cooler circuit just comes in as tubes. That's fine because all of these organisms exist in my closet, right, on the top of my refrigerator, um, in, in the crawl space of my house. They're normal organisms. You just don't want to be blowing them around when you have somebody's chest open, right? It's that. Um, so you want materials management type folk to be involved in this conversation about what is safety, right? It's not just checking off the box that says, I wiped it down, you know, once a month with the right stuff. Purchasing is also a piece of this. Um, we tend to value engineer for all the right reasons, but we then miss the piece when we, when we think, wow, you know, what is it going to cost to actually make this safe down the road if I buy this one instead of that one and this one has a design flaw? Lastly, this is all tied to pushing FDA, working with FDA, uh, to be a little tougher with device manufacturers. Devices are very easy to get into the market um, compared with drugs. The clinical trials that you have to do to get a medication on the market are pretty big um, and pretty expensive. That's one of the reasons it takes so long. But when it comes to machinery, I can design Mike's newfangled special X1000, uh, whatever it is, and patent it and get it out there, and I don't need to do very much. And that means that healthcare facilities and we in the profession need to be including that element when we think about this stuff. The last thing that I'll say about um, emerging infectious diseases is this, well, it's not the last thing, there's more. But um, a, a, a final point to make on this topic is the big difference between imported package, uh, pathogens and, um, and, and other emerging infectious diseases. When you think about importing pathogens, the first one and maybe the first several are a complete surprise. You don't get any warning, right? That means that most of our responses are reactive. It's like, oh my gosh, this is here. What do we do about it? Um, the thing that saves lives and prevents chaos are the routine practices that we have in place all the time. So this is one of the reasons why pandemic preparedness is so hard. We don't use thousands of negative pressure rooms all the time, right? It's a special single sort of case situation that is very difficult to build up for. On the other hand, we do see importation managed successfully. We've had Lassa fever imported into this country. We've had Marburg virus, which is you know, basically the same as Ebola, uh, come in undiagnosed, under the radar. The, the lady underwent surgery successful, well, it wasn't successful because she didn't have any problems. She had Marburg, um, but they didn't know it. So they opened her up, closed her back up, and no one got infected because all of the routine basic practices that we rely on were in place, right? People were appropriately using gloves and gowns and hand hygiene and environmental cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is what we want. We want a health system that does all the normal things consistently and hopefully understands why. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, so that when things do slip in that we don't notice, because that's how it's going to happen, right? We will be protected. We don't want the, 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 um, the arrival of something to be announced by a major healthcare outbreak of some new pathogen. That is a disaster. It's a disaster not just for the facility, but for medical care delivery across the board. Um, from here, I'm sure you watched what happened in Dallas. This was chaos of the highest degree. There was terror, and I'll say a lot about that terror in a moment. Um, people were very frightened. Um, and the, the reality here is that that hospital was truly challenged by an unrecognized, we can argue about whether they should have recognized, but an unrecognized, unidentified infectious Ebola patient walking in the emergency department and then moving through the hospital through ordinary paths, right? You can, you can imagine in each of the facilities that you've seen how that could happen. Um, there's a big difference between that and what our colleagues in specialty units do, right? If someone calls you and says, we've got a patient for you, we think it may be this, can you take them? And you say, yes, we'll be ready. That's great. That is perfect, and it's a wonderful resource to have. But that's not the same as any rank-and-file general hospital near an international airport being ready to have somebody wander in without warning. So just bear that in mind as you're thinking through this process today, because they're, they're a very different calculation. Um, so when I think about routine practices, what do I mean? 
Uh, some of it is how we provide care. Um, arrival assessment is something that you know, is easy for some things. If you are bleeding or clutching your chest with chest pain, hospitals in this, in this part of the world know what to do. Right? You, you go very quickly to certain pathways. We're not as good at that when it comes to somebody with vague symptoms or a fever. Right? There's so much other stuff that it can be that there's a need to sort of stop and think a little bit. History taking, though, is something that we really can't skimp on. I'm amazed at the number of calls we're getting about, all right, do we still need to ask about travel now that Ebola's done? It's like, yes, yes, it, it's part of delivering medical care. Right? You, you want to know where people have been. Um, and it's not just for Ebola. Like, if, if a person with fever and a lung infection comes in, but they were you know, a near drowning victim last week you know, off the coast, that's a different person than somebody who comes in who's been living in a nursing home and wasn't the near drowning victim. You, you need to know these things. Um, so history taking is key. Um, syndromic routing is something that you know, we do to a certain extent. Most emergency rooms and acute care clinics are pretty good about if you come in with a rash and a fever, right, they're going to think, ooh, measles, chicken pox, you know, one of those. Either way, you're not going to sit in the waiting room. You need to go over here by yourself. Um, diagnostic evaluation. What, if, what are the things that we need to have available quickly? We're in a better place now than we were 10 years ago. The rapid diagnostics that are available today are so much better and so much nicer. Um, I had my fingers crossed with the sort of space-aged Theranos company that you keep seeing in the news with the young gal who may or may not have technology that may or may not work. Um, if it does work, though, tiny, tiny blood sample, right, available in pharmacies around the country for people to just use without a prescription, it's going to make life crazy for a little while, but it could help a lot because people will arrive with a possible diagnosis. Very different game. So technology is helping us, but at the end of the day, we still need to rely on standard precautions. Now, it is easy to think about standard precautions as just a checklist of things. Hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, um, you know, use gloves, use gowns, use flash protection, blah, blah, blah. But it has to start with a risk assessment because at the heart of standard precautions, and for those of you who aren't living and breathing infection control all the time, standard precautions is what we recommend as a, a national thing that every healthcare worker use all the time for all patient contact. Just backing up historically, people were not very good at any of this. I remember when I first started working in a hospital, I was a, a phlebotomist at 4.30 in the morning. It was brutal. Um, it was more brutal for the patients because they got poked, but it was still early. Um, you know, no one wore gloves, and then the HIV epidemic hit, and suddenly people were told, you got to wear gloves. I had supervisors who had chronic active hepatitis from being exposed to blood, um, but it never occurred to them to wear gloves because that was somehow weird. Um, HIV scared people, and suddenly it was all gloves all the time, and universal precautions came on to sort of the, the, the dialogue. Um, universal precautions means you don't know who has what, so you treat all blood and body fluids as though they might be infectious. Great idea. It's a good way to go. The problem with universal precautions is it was all about protecting the healthcare worker, right? It's how do I not catch an infection? Um, and it sort of lost sight a little bit about what we do to protect patients. So standard precautions kind of brings it back to the middle ground where we need to do a lot of different things routinely to both protect ourselves, but also make sure we don't spread infection from one patient to the next. What am I talking about when I say protecting patients? How many times have you seen somebody with you know, green or purple nitrile gloves um, walking around the hallway of a hospital? I've seen a lot, right? Sometimes they're, they're um, environmental services folks, sometimes they're nursing staff, sometimes they're doctors. They're walking around with gloves. And I look at them and it's like, I, I would like to assume that you were wearing clean gloves, but I don't know that. And I'm not convinced you know that. Um, this is just like the lady who makes my sandwiches, like with the blue gloves. And she's like dipping the tuna fish onto the bread and then she drops a spoon, picks it up, and then grabs the refrigerator handle, scratches her weave. And then, you know, I'm like, well, okay, you don't have mayonnaise on your hands, but I've now got whatever all that stuff is in my sandwich. And it drives me nuts. So, you know, when we think about standard precautions, there's that piece of it as well. Not just are you using gloves, but are you using them correctly? So standard precautions is what you do every time, and the risk assessment piece boils down to what do you think might happen? Okay? This is basically my mother talking. If you think it's going to be cold, take a sweater. Right? It's that. 
If you think you're gonna touch blood or body fluids, put on a pair of gloves, easy. If you're about to lance the biggest boil you've ever seen, you might get splashed, it's gross. Put on a face shield and a disposable gown, right? Um, it's that kind of thoughtful use of these basic practices. That's standard precautions. If you think you might need it, do it. And then when you're done, take things off carefully and go wash your hands. With regard to taking things off carefully, I gotta tell you, we're really, really, really bad at it. I, I'm just, spoiler alert, um, there will be publications coming out, I think, in the next six months, but I saw some preliminary evidence looking at the proportion of times people contaminate themselves, well-trained, smart people, taking off gloves and gowns and other PPE, and it's well over 65%. I mean, we're really, really bad at this. Um, so when we talk about standard precautions, it's anticipated exposures, um, and then the procedures as well as the protective equipment. It's how you use them. Um, other routine practices, personal hygiene. What do I mean by that? Not did you use deodorant. I mean work habits and reflexes. Uh, by hygiene, I mean how do we keep ourselves sanitary in an infectious disease type way. Um, this ranges from how close do you come to a patient who's coughing? How do you take a, a, a child into your lap and point it away from you? Hopefully not, it's loaded. Children are loaded. Do not point them at other people either. But you don't want to be face to face getting that, you know, face full of stuff. Um, other things, reflexes. How many times have you seen um, the move hair out of your way, you know, tuck it back in the bonnet during the middle of a procedure, right? With gloves on, doing whatever you're doing. I see this constantly. Um, the worst is like when you're suctioning somebody and you've got sputum with what? Acinetobacter, pseudomonas, serratia, you name it, CRE, on your hands and you're, you're doing stuff and then this crosses over to um, environmental hygiene, you know, the, the pulse oximeter goes off. And so you press the button to turn the annoying alarm off, right? You finish. And then you're a good citizen. You take your gloves off, wash your hands, and you go about your business. You think you did it right. But now there's a goober on the, on the pulse oximeter button, right, just sitting there, waiting for the next time somebody pushes that button, and now it's on their glove. And maybe it's a different person whose tracheostomy is now going to be colonized that didn't have to be. So thoughtfulness about that hygiene element of how we act is something that um, is, is a key piece of these routine practices. Um, last thing I'm going to say a little bit about occupational health and environmental hygiene. I showed you the big machine, not that big, um, that seems to be posing a threat. Um, there are other elements of the environment that I think is worth thinking about. In fact, I'm, I'm willing to suggest that the 10 years that we see coming ahead of us will be an era of a lot of attention to the environment with regard to healthcare quality and infection prevention in particular. Um, the fact that we still walk into waiting areas with upholstered furniture that are crowded, the fact that we have non-cleanable surfaces um, in, um, in patient rooms, the, the fact that facilities are still designed the way they were 50 years ago or longer. Um, I, I shouldn't admit this, but there was a 25 year gap between doctor's appointments for me. Um, I, I hadn't seen a doctor in a very long time, and I hit 40-something. And like, you know, you would never let your parents get away with this, so you probably should go see the doctor. So I went. Everything was fine. Um, but I walk in, and I'm sort of expecting, after a quarter century, I was sort of expecting Jetsons, right? I was sort of expecting something really modern and wonderful to have happened in the interim. No. The same gauntlet of coughing, snotty people in crowded, upholstered waiting area, and you know, the, 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 the receptionist waiting there, and the, the patient room was exactly what I trained in back in the 80s, like totally the same. Oh, and the worst of all was the hand soap dispenser had this thick, leathery pellicle of dried material on the top, meaning no one has used it in months, if not years. And so the clinician who I was meeting for the first time, she comes in, and I'm like, hi, you know, great to meet you. I, I just have to say this right now, that, that, you can't do that. That is swimming with pseudomonas. That, that's a bad, bad thing. And to her credit, when I came back for a follow-up, they were all brand new, like, automated dispensers, and, and they, they'd up their game. But my point is, we're not doing a very good job about thinking through what healthcare facilities should look like. I still walk into glamorous, beautiful lobbies with huge floral arrangements. Why do we need this in a hospital? That's not what this is for. We need that space to be used for rationally moving people in necessary directions quickly. Um, similarly, patient rooms that look like bedrooms with you know, closets and cabinets and bed tables, 
I mean, it's comforting. I, I, I might give you just that much leeway for the birthing centers where they want it to look like home. Even though there, I draw the line at birthing pools. No offense if you're into them, but infection control for a birthing pool is not possible. Um, it, don't, don't get me started. Anyways, um, <laughs> patient rooms, though, don't need to look like bedrooms at home, right? So the question becomes, what should they look like? The regulator for the suction vacuum thing on the wall that no one ever cleans I was just talking to an industry guy that says, you know, we're, we're developing one that's autoclavable. Would that be good? It's like, I don't know that it needs to be autoclaved, but it probably does need to be cleaned because I can guarantee you there's a robust biofilm on there. And when you look at the sort of data looking at transmission of infection through things like nasogastric tubes that you know, can back up, you know, one wonders what we're doing by having these old school systems that no one's thinking about. We just assume it's correct. So the environment is a key piece of what we're thinking about. Occupational health. Here, I think there's the need with re specifically for emerging infectious diseases to be thinking about what you're going to do if something like MERS comes to this country and starts to spread in the healthcare system. What is the occupational health system that's in place to contact anybody who was in that room during these two days um, to do the follow-up to say, well, did you carpool with so-and-so on these three days? You know, that's a lot of work. It's groundwork and footwork that usually lands on you know, the state health department and the epidemiology folks who have to do that. But having an occupational health system in, in the healthcare system that you're in um, that can do some of this is key because you need, you need it for other things. You need it for tuberculosis, for chickenpox, et cetera. Um, this is something worth thinking about. I see a lot of OC health being outsourced, right? This is a reality of modern medicine. Well, part of the question about who you outsource to should include what is your response to a potential outbreak like MERS? What, what is your proposal? How are you going to support this facility from the Oc Health perspective to do that tracing? How will you work with the state health department to get them those data? I want it in writing now because during the crisis, I don't want to have to negotiate that. Right? So occupational health, key piece. I'm going to transition now, though, to the issue of why. Um, for some of you, this is going to be terribly pedantic, and I apologize. Um, but what I'm seeing is, over the course of the past generation, a fast and painful erosion of the understanding of the germ theory in this country. Um, when I was in medical school, three months were dedicated to medical microbiology. Today, how many months? Zero. Not even a week. It's all sort of subsumed into case-based learning, which means you do not get a systematic understanding of microbiology. Well, that's a problem because everything we've talked about so far hinges on having a clue as to where microbes are and how they move, right? Um, I have had a physician tell me, oh, I could not have trans transmitted hepatitis to a patient when I reused the IV tubing because I didn't see blood in the tube. I mean, this is an indictment of an entire system, right? The fact that anybody can say that. Um, so with that in mind, um, I present this. Now, this was actually developed during the anthrax response, 2001. The first guy who died, he was a journalist who opened the envelope and, and, and died a horrible death down in Florida. Um, what that did was close the coroner's office. The medical examiner's office shut down because nobody would go in. Their entire staff was terrified. And the medical examiner herself, she's a very good colleague, but she was like, I, I, I don't know that I know enough to do this safely. And so we actually flew down with the team and our pathology guys with crazy knives and Tupperwares to bring him samples. It was, it was interesting. Um, but the first thing that we had to do, and this was my role, is sit down with the group of very frightened people. Uh, very frightened people is a bigger problem than whatever it is you're actually dealing with, generally speaking. Um, and if you don't address very frightened people, these are not stupid people, these are frightened people, and if you don't deal with them properly, you're never gonna make the progress that you need. And so sitting down with them and showing them this, I expanded on it as you'll see afterwards, but this was a very quick night before throw something together kind of thing originally. Um, you know, it was an opportunity to sit down and say, look, the way you can catch anthrax is this. This is how you would have to catch it. Otherwise, you won't. Um, we're really challenged by things like anthrax and Ebola where the name itself instills fear. Um, but anthrax is pretty commonplace. You can probably swab a good proportion of the cowboy boots in Texas and find anthrax, right? This is a normal bovine disease that cattle get when they cut their lips 
on the grass at the end of summer. It's like sharp and prickly and they're nibbling and they get cuts and anthrax spores get in there and they get a big infection, they die and they poop out anthrax and bleed and that dries on the ground and the next drought, you get another cow nibbling that grass, picking up those spores, that's what happens. The weaponized anthrax that was used during the, the release is a different story. It floats around and is, is a significant problem. But once it goes through an infectious cycle, it's original anthrax again, right? Because the weaponizing is grinding it into a super duper fine powder and adding a negative static charge. That doesn't happen in a cow or a human being. Um, why am I telling you all this? Because you, 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 you really do need to grapple with the issue that organisms don't have legs, these organisms, um, legs or wings, right? They're not spring-loaded. Why am I saying that? Well, think about Ebola, where perfectly good healthcare personnel were trying to seal quarter-inch like gaps in their protective equipment with duct tape because they were terrified that something was gonna shoot through that and, 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 and get their neck, right? Okay, that's science fiction. Bacteria, viruses, fungi, they don't shoot through things and get you in the neck. They do get transmitted, though, and, and this is how. First of all, they have to leave the original host, right? So if they're in a human being or in an animal, they have to get out. What does that mean? It can be by coughing, it can be by bleeding, it can be by a clinical specimen, um, but something has to remove them from the body, otherwise they don't get out. There's also the incubation period. If I poke myself with a needle of Ebola virus, right, I don't have to immediately get taken to Dr. Lyon's facility. I can actually go home, right, turn down the thermostat, feed the cat, I don't have a cat, um, but you know, grab a couple of novels and go back to the hospital and sit there and sweat until I find out if I'm infected or not. But I've got that incubation period during which I'm not infectious. So this is important to know. Um, this is also um, something to think about when, when we deal with major catastrophes. The first time this came up in my, in my history was um, with the Turkish earthquake. The first question they said, you know, they called me, we've got all these dead bodies, do we need to bury them in trenches? You know, how long can we wait? Should we put lime on top of the bodies, et cetera? And it, you know, there was no recommendation anywhere. Um, I, I made the mistake of putting together a two paragraph response, which then made me the dead guy guy um, forever. Um, but the bottom line here is dead guys don't cough, right? A dead body is not inert, there are biochemical things going on, but it's breaking down. And so the enzymes are destroying cells, but also destroying bacterial cells. Um, Bloodborne pathogens that have envelopes um, are rapidly destroyed as the pH becomes more acidic. Um, there, there should be very little causing things to come out. And what does come out is about the same as a dirty diaper, right? If you think of mouth bacteria, gut bacteria, skin bacteria, and a couple of viruses, that's about the same thing that we routinely wad up in a little pink plastic thing and throw in the garbage can, right? So when you think about it rationally and get away from that sense of, oh my God, it's a dead body from some disease and then think immediately to Hollywood scenarios, um, it isn't that you need to do something immediately for infection prevention. You do need to make sure that those fecal bacteria don't get into a water system or a food supply. You do need to make sure that um, animals are not able to gain access or that the local population isn't further traumatized by seeing dead bodies handled badly. So it needs to be done respectfully and quickly, uh, but it's not that it's about to generate a plague. If you think historically, walking into a village full of dead people from plague, what really happened? Did you really think I was gonna be talking about villages of dead people at this talk this morning? You didn't, did you? Yeah, um, <laughs> people never do. Um, so what happens? The fleas from the Black Plague bit people, they got bubonic plague, then they got pneumonic plague, whatever. So you walk in, another flea bites you, you walk out, you get bubonic plague, and you think it was just by being in that village of dead people that you got it, right? There, there are illusions here fostered by not understanding transmission. The second step, leaving the village, is survival in, trans, uh, in, in, um, uh, in transit. Most organisms don't survive that well. The ones that we, we do see surviving are special. What's the biggest example I can think of? Well, there's anthrax because it makes spores and it survives from year to year to year in the dirt. Um, but think about norovirus, right? Cruise ship outbreaks. Why is it such a pain in the neck? It's because it's very, very sturdy. If something like influenza or um, MERS or SARS was as sturdy as norovirus or Ebola, God forbid, 
we would be in a world of trouble. But the reality is those viruses have lipid envelopes that are easily destroyed by detergents, right? That if they dry out, they don't work as well, so they don't initiate infection. Norovirus is special because it doesn't have that lipid envelope. It's very sturdy. It lasts a long time in the environment and stays infectious. So the survival and transit piece is key. When we think about long distance airborne transmission of tuberculosis and chickenpox, it's because those organisms don't die when they're floating in dry air for a long time. They remain infectious. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'll just point here to the environmental issue of humidity and temperature. <clears throat> And I say this because we have good evidence that warm, wet environments decrease the transmission of things like influenza. Why is that? It's because the cold environment sort of protects that lipid envelope a little bit longer. It, it preserves it a bit. Um, that's what we think from sort of nasal models and whatnot. Um, and so I, I bring this to you, getting back to the hospital environment, because I wonder, do we have the right humidity and temperature in our facilities? Right now, it's kind of like the hotel thing. We tend to do climate control in hospitals to make it comfortable for me to wear a suit or a white coat. Is that the reasoning we should be using? I'm not convinced it is, right? The C-suite can be engineered for beautiful coats and ties and things. But, um, but patient care areas and waiting areas, maybe they need to be a little bit warmer, a little bit more moist for the infection prevention piece. Oh, thank you. Um, there is, of course, the devil in the details. If you get too warm and too wet, you get fungi and mold, and then the next thing you know, your heating and ventilation engineering team is gonna be pounding on your door saying, what are you doing? So there, there's probably a sweet spot, though, when we think about infection transmission that we haven't identified yet. Delivery is key. Um, we've talked about inhaling tuberculosis. Um, this is different from splashes and sort of the, the zone in between. Um, here, we're, we're, we're talking about um, how we manage uh, environmental elements um, to prevent delivery. And so this means containing air. This is why we use things like negative pressure isolation rooms. Um, this is why we have special air handling. This is why we have vacuum shrouds uh, on equipment. Um, in terms of surfaces, this is also how we uh, approach device reprocessing, environmental cleaning, and hygiene. Um, this is also sharps management, right? Um, if you're thinking about HIV or hepatitis, the fact that we use sharps containers interrupts that chain of transmission. And then finally, hands, um, you know, I, I shouldn't have to say this, but I will. Um, the most efficient transmitter of infectious material to your susceptible parts will be your hands. Think about the last things that touched your eyes, right, or your nostrils. It's probably your own hands, unless you have a toddler. Um, but generally speaking, it's your own hands. And so rather than worrying about making the entire environment sterile, people say, well, should the, should the curtains be sterile? It's like, well, no, after you touch the curtains, if you're gonna to touch something else that needs to be sterile, you should clean your hands um, and, 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 and break that chain of transmission. The susceptible part of a host is a key element here. Um, human skin is actually pretty darn good at preventing infection. If that weren't the case, every time you went gardening or swam in the sea, you would come back with horrible infections, but you don't, right? Intact skin is a good thing. Susceptible areas tend to be mucous membranes, eyes, nose, and mouth. Skin breaks, like if you have bad eczema on your hands, that's a problem. Um, those are the main things. This is also the, the, the concept of devices like um, intravenous uh, access, catheters and so on. You're, you're breaking the skin. Um, and so when we think about what we're protecting, this is where PPE, personal protective equipment, and, and gloves come into play because these are the areas that we want to protect. The rest of what we wear for protection is more about not spreading things around. So it's not going to kill me to have somebody cough up something infectious and nasty on my jacket. If I take my jacket off carefully, um, I might have to ditch the jacket. I ditched a tie once. I was doing a colonoscopy as a medical student and the little instrument port was open. And so my entire tie had this mist of, of poo juice. It was terrible. Um, I have never been as upset ever in my life. It was so, yeah. Um, but, you know, you, you cut the tie off and you change your shirt and you get some scrubs and you're fine. Um, so PPE, a lot of this is to give you a layer that you can take off. It's not that it's somehow going to drill through and, you know, burrow through your abdomen and cause an infection, right? Uh, but that is the perception that we get. Why? Because of Hollywood, because of a lack of understanding of, of, of how organisms cause infections. Host defenses, this is just for completeness, but this is why we immunize people against hepatitis. 
This is why we do post-exposure prophylaxis if, if we can. Um, and, and wound care for something like rabies, um, you know, we, we want soap and water really fast because that does a huge amount to prevent infection from happening in the first place. Only if you f sort of have all of this happen can you then have an organism multiply and cause a clinical infection, right? A lot has to happen to get infected. That doesn't mean a lot isn't happening, but it's good to be thinking about all of these steps. And for uh, no other reason, perhaps, than to be able to explain it to colleagues and coworkers down the road. It's one thing to give somebody a list of things they have to do without any understanding of the why. It's another thing entirely to be able to explain to them clearly what the rationale is. Um, I show you this because despite the focus on personal protective equipment, it is really the last resort. Um, it is the thing that is um, least effective because you're relying on somebody to wear a device correctly and not harm themselves when they take it off. Um, it is also the least efficient cost-wise. You've got this disposable stuff that needs to be maintained and supply and so on and so forth. Um, if you have a fit testing program, you know that maintaining that is terribly expensive. Um, and so if you look at the other stuff, you know, first of all, have it not be there. Um, and just so you know, this particular chart does not come from a healthcare um, hierarchy slide. It comes from an industrial hierarchy slide. And I like it because it's a little bit more concrete. Um, have the problem not be there in the first place. Okay, we can't do that because infections in people are going to come to the hospital. Um, so, you know, that's not a solution. Um, substituting something, using things that aren't sharp. Back in the day, we used needles to connect IV tubing. Now we use needless connectors. Engineering controls, like isolation rooms, like sharps containers. Administrative controls that say, okay, you have to do this, this, and this. You have to be vaccinated um, or show immunity against chickenpox before you go in that room to do this thing. That kind of administrative work. Um, all of these things are far more impactful than relying on a mask or a gown. Um, but when you do it, um, we need to choose stuff that works. Um, I'm not going to give you a list of commercial products and say this one's the best or that one's the best. Um, that's not a helpful thing. Um, but I do think the rationale needs to be thoughtful. First of all, targeting the body parts that you're trying to protect, right? I can't tell you how many times I've seen people obsess about respiratory protection and a good fit on their respirator, which is important, but then completely neglect eye protection. And they're dealing with something like influenza or SARS, which, and this is, this is the sort of thing that people forget. But when you, when you blow your nose because you're, you're crying because you saw the Hallmark commercial, right? You know who you are. Um, why, are you, why are you blowing your nose? It's because your tears are going down your tear ducts into the back of your throat and out your nose, right? It's connected. And so respiratory viruses, even though they affect the back of the throat and the lungs, if they get in through your eyes, they're gonna get there, right? And so eye protection for that reason, even if this season's flu doesn't have a strong affinity to conjunctival epitopes, um, you still need to protect your eyes. And so remembering what you're trying to do is, is very important. And then real world utility. It has to work, it has to be available, it has to be comfortable, and it has to be safe and easy to use. And the, the last two tend to get short shrift. Um, and some of this is the legacy of industrial applications of, um, of personal protective equipment. Uh, you know, most of what we started using uh, was borrowed, with the exception of gowns, was borrowed from industry. Right? Respirators were for asbestos prevention, that kind of thing. Um, face shields, you know, they look a lot like welding shields because that's probably what they came from. Um, even the, the one-piece jumpsuits, these were you know, for environmental remediation and protecting all of your clothes in one piece. Um, because you don't want gaps in your PPE through which you know, grit and dust, think about the guys working to clean up 9-11, right? You don't want asbestos dust creeping in the back of your trousers, so a one-piece thing makes sense. That's not what we're dealing with, with healthcare, right? It's a very different situation. Somebody was saying, oh, we need jumpsuits because there was a lot of diarrhea with this child. And you know, with the gown being open in the back, that's not sufficient. And my question is, what exactly were you going to do with this child and her diarrhea? Are you rolling in it? No, right? Think about what you're trying to do. Um, and from that perspective, the gown makes much more sense because it was actually designed for healthcare. Remember the green cotton gowns in operating rooms that got reprocessed with the autoclave tape? Some of you don't, and that's, that's just, it uh, makes me sad. Um, 
but oh well. Uh, it, but it works well because it was designed by people doing the work to make the work go well, right? You put your arms in this way, someone helps you, it's closed in front, it's easy to take off, you can bundle it up. Um, and so thinking about the comfort, ease, and safety piece is something that I don't think we've done enough of. We've been far more interested in the data for permeability, you know, that, that is, it's fine, it's important. We want things to be effective in terms of barriers, but it also needs to be something that people can use so that they accept it and stick with it, right? Otherwise, it's not effective. It may be efficacious. You may be able to make it work in a laboratory, but in the real world, you're not gonna have effectiveness. Um, understanding, based on the cascade that I just showed you, is key to sustainability. So I can get any small group of people. This is what we do when we go into the jungle. You've got a small community terrified of a horrible outbreak of Ebola. They have very little training and awareness of how infection is transmitted. Okay? I, I probably can't instill that as quickly as I need to to control an outbreak, but I can train people up to say, these are the seven things you have to do every time you go in past this line of tape. And before you come out, you have to do this. That always gets thrown away there, and then you always get sprayed down with this. Right? I can set up some rules. Is that sustainable? Heck no. Right? You go back six months later, and there's no evidence of that having been there. First of all, they run out of supplies. But second of all, there's no good rationale about why we're doing it. I have found people in isolation units um, who did everything right, but no one ever told them that if you're going to take a nap in the unit, don't put your face on your dirty gloves. Okay, first of all, don't take a nap in the unit. The, the answer to that <laughs> was to create a, no, but I mean, it, it's hot, it's, it's tiring work. You know, it, people are tired. The answer is to create a place that's safe to take a nap, right? And then come back and put fresh gear on. So it, it, it's not that people are bad or stupid, it's that the understanding is often lacking. And so my hope is that by having people have a better sense of why they're doing these things, it'll become not only sustainable, but intuitive. Um, the, the things that we're developing right now, in addition to creating infrastructure, um, so you, you'll hear more about specialty units across the country. Um, the Assistant Secretary for Prevention and Response in Health and Human Services, ASPR, um, spends a ton of money, and we're sending matching funds from CDC to support this kind of capacity so that if you know you have someone, right, so this is going back to the beginning of the talk, if you know you have somebody who has Ebola um, or is being tested for Ebola, it's one thing to be able to receive that person unknown using routine practices and get them to the point where you're suspicious and you're deciding to test, right? That's what we're talking about with the routine practices. It's another thing to try and care for that patient for the next nine weeks that will turn a hospital upside down in terms of shifting your units around, getting enough PPE, having, having healthcare personnel willing to show up. If you have four kids at home and a husband who's terrified, you might just decide to, to stay home sick, right? So that kind of thing is a huge challenge for a facility. It's a perfect thing for specialty units where you have well-trained people who have agreed that they're gonna do this, who know who they're gonna be working with, who trust each other, and have a setup that's ready to go. So very different things, don't mix the two. Um, in addition to that, we're, we're putting together risk recognition as a topic in training. Um, I think that there are more than enough PowerPoint slides out there talking about what PPE to use for droplet precautions, what, how to do contact precautions. I'm not gonna bore you with that. There's plenty of it. What I'm seeing missing, seeing missing, what I'm not seeing is risk recognition. Ways to train people to walk into a room and see the heater cooler unit with a big fan going, oh wait, that could be bad. Seeing that someone who used their gloves inappropriately just contaminated something and needs to be redirected. People having that kind of awareness is what's gonna change how we do medical care. Think about if you went into any one of your hospitals tomorrow and lit up a cigarette. How many people would jump on you, tackle you, and wrestle you to the ground and stamp out that cigarette? Everyone, right? Visitors, guests, nursing staff, doctors, environmental service, everyone knows that that's not okay. We're trying to do the same thing with injection safety. We actually had a very, it was good news, bad news. A, um, an obstetrician in New York used one syringe, loaded it up big time, and then just went down the hallway and immunized a bunch of patients. 
And having seen that, his unit secretary, his receptionist, actually said, you know, I read in USA Today last week that you're not supposed to reuse syringes. We should probably call the state health department. And they did, and you know, we followed up, and nobody got infected with hepatitis. But um, the cool thing, even though it was tragic that a physician thought it was okay to do that, the cool thing is that the receptionist, she got it. She said, that's not okay. And I want that same kind of risk recognition to start to percolate through our population. I want moms to be able to say, oh, no, 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 I just saw that you touched that and now you've done this. You know, we need to wipe that down. Because moms can do that, right? Um, we, we need to get to that point where it's, it's a combination of understanding and common sense as opposed to just hoping that people will remember this 20-point checklist six years from now. So what are we doing in addition to that? We've got mandated uh, training for bloodborne pathogens. We're also focusing a lot on um, amplifying onboarding. Um, there's a lot of work being done on group-specific training. Um, I think we neglect, um, I, I mentioned materials management, but environmental services. If you're expecting somebody who's you know, speaking a second or third language, who gets paid minimum wage and is working as, as an hourly worker with no benefits, um, to you know, pay attention to the details of dwell time and everything else that goes into cleaning, you know, you can't make that assumption without giving them the information they need. Um, this is another one of those things where I'm on a personal mission to get the word housekeeping out of hospitals. Housekeeping is for hotels, right, where they fluff your pillow, nothing is all that sanitary, I hate to say, um, but it sure looks nice and they spray some scented spritzer stuff and then they walk away. It's great. Um, that's all we need in a, in, in, a, uh, in a hotel. But in a hospital, environmental services actually has impact on whether patients survive, right? Um, they might well have more impact than many professionals um, who, are, who are there to, to, to make decisions because I can make the best decisions in the world, but if there is a huge reservoir of untreatable CRE sitting there in the lavatory uh, because someone didn't know that they were supposed to use that disinfectant instead of this one, um, that can actually kill the patient, right? So understanding who we're treating and why. Dialysis text is on here uh, because until recently in the United States, there wasn't even a requirement for a high school diploma. So the person taking all of my blood out of my body, running it through a machine and putting it back in my bloody three times a week, her job might have been at McDonald's last week, right? So understanding what we're relying on. I mentioned nursing homes with almost no infrastructure for infection control. Radiology technicians who are doing contrast studies, right? This is an injection therapy. How many times have you seen loops of IV tubing in reservoirs of contrast hanging there and wondered, is that brand new for one patient? Or is that about to get reused and do I need to talk to somebody, right? I don't wanna have to have that concern. And so broadening the people that we treat is key. And then lastly, assessing competency. It's very hard to assess competencies. Um, and devising a better way that we can systematically understand whether or not this person has captured the information we want them to know or whether they need to be refreshed. This is not a punitive thing. Um, and it shouldn't be sort of a trivialized part of your licensure, just check the box kind of thing. It needs to be something that leads to effective function. Um, and so instilling risk assessment is, is, is key here. I wanna say also that we're in an era, in addition to the environmental piece, where human factors research is gonna play a greater and greater role in what we do. What do I mean by that? Back in the day, remember ventilators used to be, look, they, they, they looked like small refrigerators, they were flat on top, and what went on top of the, uh, of the, of the surface? It was the used suction tube catheter, right, with goo, um, because it was right there, it's perfect. Um, that's not good. Well, now that it's all flat screens, there's no surface, and that problem went away, right? We cured a human thing. Um, now what do we have? We have flat surfaces on garbage cans that is so tempting to put clean linens on while you wash your hands because you're a good citizen. And then you pick up the linens and put them on the bed. That doesn't strike me as optimal. How about a nice shelf next to every hand washing sink where things can be placed? Um, I've watched people want to wash their hands but they've got clipboards and notebooks and laptops and they're like, oh, I'll just go in quickly. But if there was a shelf there where you could put something down, that can solve that problem. So you know, looking at the human factors uh, elements in terms of facility design, equipment design, work processes, you know, we, we, we don't tend to rethink things. We'll redesign a facility and not change how we do work. And then social networks. This is probably the biggest and least visible thing. 
But what I'm seeing, and I go around the country and I see a lot of facilities. Some of them I see them because they're doing something wrong. Um, but a lot of them I get to see because they're doing something right. And the ones that are most successful, it's not one person's job. It's not, you know, Jack is the infection control pro um, professional who prevents infections. Um, when, when you ask a place that's successful, whose responsibility is it? They say, oh, so we have the pharmacy director, we have the uh, PNT committee, we also have the director of nursing, we have the ICU director, we have materials management, environmental services, and of course, infection control and hospital epi. It's a team of eight to 10 people. They meet weekly, they address problems, they document them, they bring them up to leadership um, and give us rationale, we, we support that, we get it done, and we have this constant sort of culture of, of getting things fixed. Um, nursing units where nurses meet and decide what they're going to tackle as a community and say, look, we think we can do better with Cowdy. Um, we're going to tackle these three elements. We're going to tackle insertion. We're going to tackle you know, where, the, um, where the bag is and how the tubing is laid out. And this is what we're going to focus on um, every day. And then for a week, this is just one example, they, all rated, they came up with their own checklist, their little survey form, and for a week they rated themselves. And then the second week, they started rating each other. And the rate of infections in that unit dropped to almost zero. It was amazing. And so that kind of social networking um, is, I think, something that we'll see more of. Lastly, adaptive systems um, that, that feed back information um, to, to the people who are doing the work so that you hear how you're doing. With antimicrobial stewardship, for example, looking at antimicrobial rates, um, seeing how your behaviors tie to the outcome for the facility and patients. I'm showing you this because of the 70,000 deaths that we can attribute to healthcare associated infections in this country every year. Emerging infectious diseases, which is, believe it or not, what I'm talking to you about, um, are, are a huge challenge and an important thing. But the reason I, I've spent so much time with you this morning on those routine basic core practices is because 70,000 people shouldn't be dying of healthcare associated infections in this country every year. This is the reality. It's not the one cluster of MERS that I'm worried about. Um, AR, 23,000 deaths. At the end of the day, what I'm asking for is really, really hard. I'm asking for perfect care. And put yourself in the patient seat. If you're laying there with an IV in your arm, don't you want everything to be perfect? I mean, you don't want a roll of the dice, a toss of the coin, when that next person comes and does something for you, right? You want it to be perfect. I want everything to be perfect, and it's not going to be the status quo. We can't get to perfect doing what we're doing today, which is why all of those environmental issues and human factors issues need to be part of what we do, uh, because this is a very big lift. It's not landing and taking off a single plane um, just one time with two people in the cockpit. It's dozens and dozens of people impacting every individual patient multiplied by thousands of patients every single day. So it's a big lift. But this is where we're headed, I'm just letting you know, um, and I thank you for your help and your attention.